Good evening, everyone. My name is Keith Williams, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. We protect the ancestral lands of the Susquehannock, the Conestoga, and Shanks Ferry people. And my hope is that we care for these lands as well as these native peoples. For 50 years, our organization has sought out natural places that are so precious and beautiful, they must be protected. Our stewardship team then works to restore these special places by creating trails, removing invasives, and planting trees. These preserves are open for you and I to use to hunt, hike, fish, bird watch, 365 days a year. Special places like Shanks Ferry, House Rock, Pelham Hills, Kelly's Run, Otter Creek, Climbers Run, Welsh Mountain, and many others are protected forever. We launched Nature Hour with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help us better understand the Conservancy's work, and the work of our community partners. The format for tonight's lecture will be a 30 to 40 minute presentation with 15 to 20 minutes of questions and answers at the end. If you have questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we'll include your questions as part of the conversation. This is the second lecture of our 2023 winter season. Our next Nature Hour will be February 8th on Pennsylvania's outdoor recreation economy with Conser Conservancy board member, and Chief Strategy Officer of the York Economic Alliance, Silas Chamberlain. You can learn more and pre-register for this lecture and many other events on our website, lancasterconservancy.org under upcoming events. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support and tonight we wanna to recognize our annual sponsors who include Clark Associates, Stauffers of Kissel Hill, Lakshwama, Electron Energy Corporation, Eurofins, Dart, Ritu, and Penn Stone. We couldn't do what we do without their support. And now I'd like to introduce tonight's Nature Hour, York Wildlands, Get Your Elevation On, with the Conservancy's very own Peggy Epping. Peggy's work in tracking the present range of an endangered bee species, the yellow banded bumblebee, from 2011 through 2016, was equal parts mountaineering in the White Mountains of New Hampshire and diving deep into archival insect collections in the back rooms of natural history museums from Georgia to Maine. Current research is showing that factors leading to the rapid decline of the young, yellow banded bumble are indeed complex and interrelated, but all factors combine to force rain shifts to higher altitude locations and more northerly latitudes. Elevation provides refuge, and it is in this work that Peggy developed a passion for elevated ecological communities, whether found on rocky bluffs, mountain ridge lines, or layered into ravine cliffs high above a stream valley floor. These kinds of communities require dedicated conservation management and protection that as a ranger in Vermont, she was more than happy to enforce in fragile alpine zones and along cliffside trails in the Green Mountains and Northeast Kingdom. Peggy's worked in conservation education for over 40 years with the Park Service in South Carolina, Maryland, and Vermont. She holds a PhD in conservation history, serves as a lecturer for the Environmental Studies Department at Goucher College, and the Conservancy is very fortunate to have her as our outdoor environmental educator. She's a good friend of mine. I have the pleasure of working with Peggy every day. And we've had the pleasure of speaking about the, uh, the yellow banded bumblebee that I wasn't even aware of before you came on board with us, Peggy. But I never really connected the work that you did with the yellow banded in New Hampshire with the work that we do here in, in, in our region as a conservancy. So I'm really interested in learning more. Thanks for being here tonight. Great, thank you guys. Let me get my screen going. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to, um, to connect the two. And can you guys see that? We have it, thank you. All right, how's that look? Good? That's a okay. beautiful picture. Do you know where that is? <laughs> I think I do. I think, yeah, I think there's a couple people on, on tonight uh, who have checked in already who can probably name exactly where this is. So people um, can put that into the chat or the Q&A if they have the yeah, application. Because I believe there may be three or four of us who stood on this tiny little ledge together over the road below. Anyway, so thanks for this opportunity, everybody, um, to talk a little bit about um, my work uh, it, with in this endangered bumblebee species, which used to be very common in Pennsylvania throughout the Mid-Atlantic and straight on down the Appalachia train, uh, mountain range to Georgia. Uh, the Bombus terracola or the yellow-banded bumblebee would have been found 100 years ago pretty much everywhere in the east, except for the extreme southeast. Um, and now, as, as I'll go into, 
it, it's pretty limited in range. We'll talk about why that is briefly. And then I'm going to compare uh, this idea of elevation as refuge to, we might, not have the, we might not have the white mountains, you know, the spectacular white mountain range here in the Susquehanna Valley, but we have environments and ecological communities that kind of act like what is found in the White Mountains. So I'm gonna do a little comparison um, concerning elevated communities and, and why these ecological communities climb or why they stay at elevation and what we can find in them as they pertain to in, um, the Lancaster Conservancy properties, uh, three in particular on the west side of the river. Um, I wanna make clear too that what I say in this presentation can, can be applied to other conservancy um, nature preserves as well. I mean, we, we have a lot of steep land, a lot of bluffs, a lot of cliffs, a lot of ravines in both York and Lancaster County. Um, but just for sake of you know, creating a common thread, I decided to do three ref, uh, nature preserves here on, on the York County side. So let's get going. Um, ravine to bluff ecology is, is nothing new to ecological studies, uh, but the reason ecological communities find refuge in these types of habitats is becoming um, a thing now, certainly as climate change comes into the picture. So let me just start off with a little review of some of my work um, as I was working on my uh, doctorate research, uh, my thesis for um, the range shift of Bombus terracola. And, and there, there he is, he's in the center picture um, on the right. Bombus terracola is a, a bumblebee and it, it's it can be identified in the field, although this picture doesn't really show it, but it has sort of like this little hula skirt of long hairs at the tip of its um, abdomen, almost down where the sting is, but those hairs are really long and feathery and it really sets, a, sets it apart um, and very bold yellow and, and gold banding. And like I said, it, it used to be found everywhere. And you can see the, the range map on this slide of where it was found um, commonly a, a hundred years ago. And here we are when I did my research, which was to try to track its range shifts along the East Coast or Eastern states um, from 2011 to 2016. This is where I found most of the colonies um, in New Hampshire. One or two colonies uh, survive in Pennsylvania in the um, Bear Meadows region, south of State College. But uh, it seems like the whole population uh, rain shift is happening through mountainous regions. And so all of those blue dots there are my um, field sites for those years that I worked you know, in the whites. Uh, field sessions of maybe two weeks every summer. It was, I didn't live on the side of the mountain, but I was you know, kind of working at elevation where I might've been roped in, you know, sitting in a, in a climbing harness, to get down to some of these isolated cliff communities or walking along um, busy roads to find, you know, kind of man-made meadows, uh, overlooks and parking lots in the White Mountain Range. So all of those blue dots kind of follow uh, different public lands, particularly the White Mountains uh, National Forest. The green and light blue dots were fellow researchers uh, who were working also during this time span. The yellow dots are um, colony confirmation um, sites from 1906 to 1916. So it was kind of cool that we did this research almost exactly a hundred years later to show this rain shift. And you can see that there were substantial colonies um, found in the Southern part of New Hampshire, but in addition, all through Massachusetts and New York and Connecticut, Pennsylvania. So there were a lot of yellow dots. And these yellow dots represent um, samples or specimens taken from those colonies that exist in historic uh, or ar archival insect collection collections. That I can go and see who collected it, um, take a look at the actual specimen, note the date and any notes that the researcher may have 
may have left. So you can see that there's been a, a huge shift. And for Bombus terracola, the, the shift is due to a couple of um, different but interconnected factors. I'm not gonna get into that tonight. That might be a whole nother lecture. Um, but as we're seeing across its Northern range into Canada, you know, out West, all up into the Maritimes of Canada, especially, they, these bumblebees are moving up in altitude. So they're abandoning where they are surviving. They're abandoning agricultural areas. They're abandoning um, the Piedmont almost entirely in the mid-Atlantic and then moving up in elevation into mountain ranges where they may or may not have existed before. Um, so elevation is refuge. And I stuck this picture in of my son, George. Um, this is a long time ago, he looks so young, but he's now an astrophotographer. Um, and he, while I was working during the day, he was working at night in the White Mountains. So I just wanted to give him a shout out. because He was at the other end of the rope, let's put it that way. <laughs> making sure that mom didn't, you know, completely fall off the cliff looking for her bumblebees. But um, so yeah, the, the, the long and short of it is the Bombus terracola is now red listed or categorized as endangered. Um, the population is really declining, um, mostly because of a combination of factors, but where they do survive, it's up in the mountains. And I became interested in this idea of elevation as refuge as a result of this work. Um, and in this case, it's, it's due to climate change. Um, it's due to um, neonic uh, chemicals used in agricultural land. Uh, the rain shift is also due to um, just land use in general, loss of habitat. Um, so anyway, so that's where it started, this interest in, interest in elevation as refuge. Um, so tonight I want to take a look at three specific nature preserves that the that Lancaster Conservancy maintains and manages. Helm Hills, which is where that first picture was from. Yay, Helm Hills. Um, looking out over River Road below and um, the, the river way down below. Um, Otter Creek Nature Preserve and then McCall's Ferry. And what connects all of these in terms of tonight's discussion of elevation as refuge is the Mason Dixon Trail. So you can see it, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but you can see the little light blue line that runs along the western shore of the Susquehanna and inland through York County. That's the Mason Dixon Trail. It's about um, 200 miles long. It might be a little longer because of reroutes recently. Um, so if you're hiking through these preserves on the west shore and you see the blue blaze, on a tree or a, a fence post, or in this case of uh, in Harford County on a, a farm a farm gate post. Um, this is a pretty well-known long distance trail. It starts in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, as it says on the sign there on top of High Point and runs all the way to Whiskey Springs, which where it intersects with the Appalachian Trail. So this is kind of a cool trail to explore as it runs through our preserves because it'll take you to the places that, you know, if you're careful, use your hiking poles um, and look up now and then, don't keep looking at your feet all the time. You can discover these um, elevated refuge communities. Um, and a lot of this has to do with our geology. And I wanted to point out that on the Nature Hour series, we've already had two excellent speakers who have dived into the geology of York, but mostly Lancaster County. Um, so I've, I've listed those here and the links to those um, videos on the YouTube channel on our, uh, on our um, Nature Conservancy TV are listed in the chat. And then I wanted to bring into uh, your viewing menu, um, Jerry Jones. I know a lot of people know Jerry. He's sort of a, um, a superstar in geology. He used to work for York Parks retired from York and now works as an independent geological or geology consultant, good friend of ours. Um, but he has an excellent YouTube um, video of specifically the geology of York County. So I don't wanna go dive too deep into that, but the dark blue dots on our map here show those three nature preserves. I'm gonna link up through the Mason Dixon Trail tonight. 
Um, and just so you know, we are in the bioregion known as the Upper Piedmont. So it's hilly, it's very eroded, it's incised streams and creeks. Um, the beginning of the foothills to the Appalachian Mountains, the further north you go into the Highlands region. So um, it looks flat on a, on a geological map, but as anyone who has hiked the Mason-Dixon Trail knows, it is anything but flat, which sets us up perfectly for a study of these elevated communities. So um, I watch a lot of people hike and, and for obvious and safety reasons, you should be looking down to see where you're putting your feet, but stop walking now and then and look up. Um, so if you're hiking through ravines or a gorge, uh, say in May, even into June, uh, you might be walking under entire communities of the Columbine flower, which you can also see at Shanks Ferry Wildflower Preserve. Um, but these, uh, these types of wildflowers love clinging to vertical rock wall. And so I want to point out too that the idea of elevated communities in, in the context of where we live in this, you know, upper Piedmont region of ravines, gorges, and bluffs. Um, it can mean a couple of different things in relation to elevation. Um, knowing that isolated communities can exist on the side of a cliff, um, elevated communi communities can be communities in suspension, suspended communities in, in say a tree canopy. Um, or perched communities. And that's where, you know, where we have that whole Bomba terra, Bombus terracola um, discussion because those are perched communities as bumblebee, um, social bumblebee communities existing on cliff faces or wherever um, pollination resources, nectar resources might exist in the mountains. Uh, the same kind of thing can be said of of here, we have perched communities that are on the sides of bluffs or cliff faces, uh, on the on rock walls, in in gorges, in like say Kelly's Run, or certainly along um, uh, McCall's Ferry, the, the Mason Dixon Trail as it goes through the McCall's Ferry Nature Preserve. You look up. I always carry a compact set of binoculars so I can look up, or um, once I get to the top, look down on what I couldn't see from below, and so that always helps to be able to magnify your view to zoom in and see what you couldn't see just you know trotting along trying to keep your balance and not falling off um so sort of as a, a point by point um investigation of these elevated ecological communities big difference between what i did in in, in new hampshire in the white mountains and what i'm going to share with you tonight is that elevated communities happen here because of the industrialization of our local landscapes back in the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, anything that was sloped or flat was probably logged or quarried or mined. And it was those vertical spaces on those bluffs and cliffs that weren't touched in that hundred year stretch of intensification of natural resource extraction um, that served today as surviving refugia um, these types of communities can also exhibit microclimates, depending on the slope and the aspect, which way they face south, north, where the predominant winds blow, how much sun they receive. Um, and also the, the corridor, the river itself, acting as a migratory pathway. When we think of you know, birds following a flyway, and the Susquehanna is an integral part of the Atlantic flyway. But we also have flyways through these nature preserve communities that are vital to butterflies and vital to other migrating animals such as bats. And you can find these types of migratory communities using these elevated um, parts of our, our preserves in, in which to fly safely, to move safely and avoid predators, um, but also as unbroken pathways where they don't have to cross large expanses of agricultural land or um, highways now housing developments. So in, in summary then of our major points, a lot of our elevated communities, whether it's the verticality of a ravine or a gorge or say a bluff, an actual elevated altitude bluff are, are existing because they were isolated and they were inaccessible for industry. So with that, let's take a look at some of the industries 
um, that we can pick up on as we hike along the Mason Dixon Trail and connect the dots of these three nature preserves. So a predominant rock type is for, for McCall's Ferry and for Otter Creek is the Wissahick and Schist. This is the Loch 12 historic area near McCall's Ferry Nature Preserve. And you can get a sense of what the rock looks like by looking at this old lime kiln. Um, in order to fire a lime kiln or any other type of furnace, be it a um, you know, um, blacksmith shop or a forge or a full iron furnace, you needed a lot of lumber. And so back in the 1800s, up until technology changed for anthracite coal and away from charcoal, you had, I'm gonna skip that one of the canal, you had um, the use of vast amounts of lumber. So to keep any type of iron furnace, and here's Cador's iron furnace, which is, can be found, which is found on the outskirts of the Hellum Hills Nature Preserve on Furnace Road. Um, it's about a thousand acres of hardwood a year. And a lot of people will notice and say, you know, that they notice, you know, on some of the slopey land, and certainly the Mason-Dixon Trail goes right through a lot of these structures, you'll cross through these charcoal hearth areas, which are just large, round, flat areas that once held um, structures like this. So this is about a 25-foot high um, stack of hardwood that was harvested from nearby forest. Um, colliers or the men who maintained this cut and maintained and built this stack of hardwood and then managed it as they reduced it into charcoal that was used by the furnaces. You know, that is a whole industry in and of itself. So we have a lot of evidence that our three nature preserves were fairly logged off, except for these isolated ravines and high bluffs and cliffs. So um, next time you're on a hike with me, I'll point these out. I always point out the, the charcoal hearths as we go along. I like to dig a little bit and pull up some charcoal and, you know, is it oak, is it chestnut um, or other hardwoods that they were harvesting? Luckily for us, um, and there, you can see the Mason Dixon glaze way up on, the, on a tree further up this, this path. Lucky for us, those industrial folks, whether they were loggers or colliers, or miners or quarriers or farmers, um, constructed roads through these ravines um, and around the contours of these high ridges. And a lot of the Mason-Dixon Trail and a lot of the trails that are maintained and managed and built by Lancaster Conservancy use, utilize these old 19th century and older um, roadbeds. So whether it was for wagons or horses um, or all of the above, uh, these roads still exist and allow us access. So let's talk about Helen Hills first. So in actual elevation, the bluffs stand at about 850 feet. And that's not like the White Mountains, is it? You know, it's not like 6,000 feet or you know, even 3,000 feet in Pennsylvania as, as we consider a mountain, our highest mountains between three and 4,000 feet. 850 doesn't sound like a lot, but it is um, when you consider that these communities that wind up in these areas um, were escaping in some cases or just left alone by those extractive industries that worked all the slopes that were safe to work, but not these bluffs, not the cliffs. So these elevated communities have existed for a long time, hundreds of years, um, basically untouched by extractive industries like you know, logging. Although there has been quarrying done in the Hellum Hills, uh, it, it, there are you know, spots of quarry that do intersect some of our trails there, but not to the extent that, say, the larger quarries down by the river do. And I wanted to point out, too, about geology. So here we have quartzite. This is a quartzite bluff. As, as you can learn in those YouTube videos that are you know, past Nature Hour programs, the quartzite ridges run clean across the river over into Lancaster County, the Chickies Rock Formation. And there is evidence of what this quartzite was before it was a bluff. And you can see my hiking pole in the lower right there. And it's on a, on a, on a piece of quartzite um, rock that shows trace fossils of marine worms. So the vertical lines are actually burrows and dens. It's a couple horizontal lines in there as well as those dens connected and uh, burrows went sideways as well as vertical. So you can find evidence of past habitat and past communities um, on the ocean bottom that are now thrust up in the air at 150 feet. Um, I mentioned that this is a you know, 
a flyway. The Susquehanna River is um, complete with four or five important bird areas as designated by the Audubon Society. Um, but in, in this little uh, graph graphic of the Atlantic Flyway, you can see the Atlantic Flyway in green, I hope it shows up as green on your screen, um, incorporates large parts of maritime Canada, the mid-Atlantic, all the way down into South America. And much of the flyway follows mountain ridges, mountain ridges and rivers in our area. So the Susquehanna is vitally important to birds, but also butterflies, like I said before, bats. Um, it serves as a corridor. So as we're hiking along Helm Hills and um, so there's Mike. Sorry, Mike, if you're on tonight and you didn't know I was going to use our slide. There you are. Um, the Mason-Dixon Trail follows some pretty rocky ground through Helm Hills. And it's, it's this type of rocky ground and, and, and the bluffs that the trail follows over, which create these um, inaccessible, hard to log, hard to quarry, um, regions that were sort of left alone in the 1900s. So I like to kind of go off trail, don't tell anybody I do that, and explore some of these, you know, these steeper hillsides or, you know, bouldery patches um, where, you know, maybe there exists some communities that have not been disturbed um, or, or bothered in any way for the last hundred years. And there's the, the double blaze of the of the um, Mason-Dixon Trail below. And thank you to all the land stewards, managers who keep our trails looking so great. Mason-Dixon um, Trail Club, and then our folks up at Helen Hills who even go through and blow the leaves away right before I lead a trip. So thank you, Travis. Um, I wanna point out these two uh, herpes, these two uh, salamander on the left and lizard on the right, and these guys can survive the, those bluff habitats, those elevated bluffs. So the Eastern Redback Salamander is um, a, a salamander that doesn't require a, a wet or moist environment. And you can find them living under rocks, even when there's you know, no running stream, no running water, as long as a little moist underneath, uh, you can find redbacks. They're very prominent in the fall as they mate and the females lay their eggs. If you're gonna go looking for salamanders, please try not to pick them up. And if you do, make sure your hands are wet. They breathe through their skin. So if we're holding a redback salamander, which is terrestrial salamander, it doesn't require water. Um, we don't wanna you know, damage basically its skin as lungs. So wet hands or what I do, I carry a archeologist trowel with me. I'll trowel underneath. Um, a salamander and lift it up on a, on a puff, little puff of earth. And, you know, so we, we can show folks, but um, yeah, otherwise just leave them in place. But terrestrial, and they absolutely thrive in these elevated bluff areas, um, under rocks, under logs. Our fence lizard, which is our, our only um, species representing the, the spined and spiky lizards that are so common out in the West. This is the only spined lizard we have here. Um, they love the hot exposed elevation areas of our bluffs um, and our, our, our dry xeric mesic um, forests that don't receive a whole lot of uh, spring or, or stream water and rely strictly on clouds or um, fog along the river or rain, um, maybe snow. I have found so many box turtles on the bluffs at Helm Hills. I don't want to say where they are, but I do believe this is a refuge population um, that is persistent. Uh, you know, you figure the Helen Hills area is probably logged three or four times in a hundred years, um, which is no good for box turtles, but they do survive and are doing very well up around the bluffs. Every one of these turtles has bite marks on its shell. Um, so something has tried to eat all of them. Um, and of course they close up their shells and, and, and wait it out until the predator either gets bored or decides it's so hungry it doesn't want to bother with these. So yeah, box turtles are doing well in these elevated communities, also in our ravine areas. Um, do I find a lot of box turtles in our preserves? McCall's Ferry, I'm going to wander south on the Mason-Dixon Trail. McCall's Ferry historically was a ferry, so the upper right picture shows the path of the ferry from York. Um, York County to looking across the river at Lancaster County. And it was a very busy thoroughfare um, up until the, the ferry closed in the 1900s. And 
Um, you can find old pictures of the covered bridge that followed the ferry. And then after the covered bridge collapsed, it's just the, it's the footings of the bridge that remain in the river. But as you, as you walk through the McCall's Ferry Nature Preserve, you're following some old footpaths, um, not so much roads, as I mentioned before, but you know, probably footpaths that go way back to um, indigenous people. So these are paths that have been walked by people for a thousand or more years. Uh, there's no indication of archeology. span There's no rock carvings at McCall's Ferry, um, but these paths have been there a long, long time. And so in terms of an elevated community, we're talking now about ravine walls. And there's my Coonhound Amos in the middle for scale. And there's a, a beautiful ravine wall to the, his left. And I like to, to climb up these around the easy way, not straight up the ravine wall, and then look down to see what might be living there. And, and I'm really surprised by some of, of our, I'm not going to say rare ferns, but ferns that you don't find in other well-traveled areas. Our maidenhair fern and our ebony spleenwort are, they abound at McCall's Ferry. These are the dark stem, tough ferns that are um, really resilient. Um, they can live on super thin soils and extract the nutrients they need from a, a fraction of an inch of soil and, and even root directly into the rock. So this is a, a really great set of ferns to find at McCall's Ferry, also at Hallam Hills. Um, maidenhair, you can find a little more generally elsewhere. Um, ebony spleenwort will grow specifically on the gorge walls. They love growing directly on rock. So look up or look down when you've gotten to the top to find these communities. And they support um, or part of communities that include uh, specific insects and uh, salamanders. I mentioned the redback would be certain to be found in this community. Um, but they're on ledges and they're on cliff sides and, and sometimes you know sheer faces of cliff where there's no handhold there's no foothold there's no horizontal space for anything else to grow you'll find this bean wort um, quite happily um, so there's a, a bumblebee one of our common bumblebees here um, pollinating um, uh, ghost pipe uh, these are just some of the interesting coral ferns and the ghost pipe that I've, I've photographed within the gorge area, um, either on rock wall or at the base of rock wall where nutrients from, from the, the cliffs or the bluffs are coming down um, and certainly sticks and um, logs and limbs from trees gather at the base of these cliffs. So you have a lot of decay going on, a lot of um, rot and a lot of things feeding on that. So look for that kind of um, community as well, your fungal communities. Otter Creek, which is kind of between the two, between McCall's Ferry and Helen Hills. Now this is an example of um, a deep ravine where you start hiking, let's say at the, um, at the Overlook parking lot and you're hiking down the Mason Dixon Trail to the base of the Stream Valley floor. You're following those blue blazes and you'll go from 500 feet at the bluff height to 250 feet at the Stream Valley floor. And it's very steep hiking. Take your hiking poles, go slow. But look around because this is an old growth forest. This is a very mature, um, isolated forest. It was, it's growing on such steep land that loggers and you know, other folks who needed wood um, were unable to get to it. So some very old examples of hemlock, um, tulip poplar, oak, um, are throughout the valley stream floor and up these steep um, hillsides. And the Mason-Dixon Trail follows right along uh, the steep side wall of this uh, stream valley floor. I like to look for um, communities that are growing or uh, survive, exist on, on, on ledges. So here's a, a great little community of rock polypody fern. Um, and there's a picture in the upper right where you can see the little uh, spore packets that will send out, you know, spores to, to start the cycle over again. But to find these growing in an eighth of an inch of soil, um, again, rooted into the rock, or usually moss communities surround them, uh, great little micro communities and, and microclimates to look at. So here's, a, here's another good look at that uh, Wissahickon schist, but not up thrust, not, not bluff like where it's tumbling, but actually in its, its layers as it would have been one time as ocean, ocean bottom. Within the Otter Creek Preserve, because of the mature forest, 
you have a lot of dead and dying wood um, and just an amazing amount of uh, fungal discoveries. And here, this is sort of just a little palette of um, fungal communities that I've, I've observed on logs. And sometimes you can find up to a dozen different species on one log um, and more. Wolf's blood is always fun to find. It's teeny tiny little, almost like pimples on the side of a mossy log. You find this a lot on hemlock. So you can find this quite easily at um, Otter Creek. And if you poke one of those little pimple things, they actually ex exude red fluid. So they, they bleed. It's pretty cool to do with kids. Jelly ear fungus, old man in the woods, is one of my favorite mushrooms, it's really hard to find, um, but it's specific to these old hardwood, mature forest um, decay communities. And the crust fungi are some of my favorite because they, they're so surprising. Um, these were all found at uh, Otter Creek. So they exist as crust or like a stain on a log or just a little bit of dust. And then when the temperature's right, microclimate's right, um, they will burst forth into some kind of cool fruiting body um, maybe once every couple of years and really lucky to find them when they fruit like this. The slime molds abound at, um, at Otter Creek. And this is one example of the slime mold. This is the red raspberry and it does move around. Well, you can visit day after day and find that it's moving around its little rock face or its, its log. And of course, more coral fungus. The one thing I have found at all three of these preserves and on steep slopes are evidence or, and survivors of the American chestnut. So for scale, the forest ranger from, I think this is 19, yeah, 1911, um, standing next to a mature American chestnut. You can see his little ax stuck in the side of that chestnut. Um, it's almost ridiculous how small that is. So 25% of the mid-Atlantic forest uh, at the turn of the century, 1900, 25% of our forest was American chestnut. The, the, the chestnut blight came in um, early part of the century decimated the chestnut forest, but they still survive. So when I hear folks say, you know, the chestnut is gone, it is not. It just exists in a different form. And I think Eric, our forester brought this up in a previous Nature Hour as well. Um, the chestnut survives by, um, through its roots. So it's stump sprouts. And that center sketch shows that you, know, you can have a stump that was cut or fell a hundred years ago. And the root system is still very much alive and sending up these water sprouts or stump sprouts, which then picture on the right shows these you know, chestnut leaves on small stems. Sometimes the stems can get as big around as maybe eight inches in diameter. Um, but sadly, the fungus is still very active above ground. So the root systems survive and the sprouting tree might survive for 20 years or so, and then eventually the fungus will, will take it. Although there are survivors, there are mature survivors that are producing seed. And I've, I found one recently um, out at Cador State Park, a mature chestnut that has been dropping seed. Um, so I wanted to point out too, these are the books I actually take in my backpack with me. They're small. Um, let me pull one and just hold it up for you. So, you know, it's that thick, I can stick it in my backpack. I don't take a whole lot of books with me. I do use my phone apps like um, um, iNaturalist to identify things in the field if I get signal. Often in ravines, you do not get signals. So I'll take this selection with me as I go looking for these elevated communities. Um, I've been able to share these out with some folks on, on our hikes and our walks and show you how to use keys or identifying um, factors for wildlife within within these books and they seem to be good for just you know all-purpose hiking and exploring um i want to i'm going to finish with my turtle here and we'll take questions i want to point out that i i i don't i'm not comfortable with giving exact locations of finding particular species um, here in the mid-atlantic collecting for the pet trade is a big problem so i will say that you know black market um, systems for turtles, for salamanders and snakes is, is a big problem in the mid-Atlantic, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey. Um, and these animals often go overseas as part of, you know, pet 
the pet trade. So I don't like to give exact locations to where as to where I find these creatures, especially when it's a good healthy population. So if you come along with us on a hike, I'm happy to point out where these populations exist, but I prefer not to give like coordinates where I find things. Um, I don't share that information on any of my apps, um, certainly not in anything shared you know, with a, a crowdfunded uh, or crowdsourced uh, app where people will note where they find certain species. So whether it's rare plants or threatened or species of concern in these types of elevated communities, I just kind of keep mum on where I'm finding things. So showing you pictures of what I'm finding in the preserves, I think serves best for tonight, but I'm not gonna pinpoint and for the purposes of this presentation, exactly where I find them in Otter Creek or Helen Hills or McCall's Ferry. Uh, so anyway, these are isolated communities that have survived the industrial age, uh, that survive now thanks to Lancaster Conservancy uh, habitat management, and that you can experience and you can find for yourself. Uh, just get out there, walk slow, take your hiking poles, go carefully, go slowly, take your binoculars, and definitely your camera. And um, I hope you guys can join us for a hike in the future where we can explore some of these you know, steep-sided communities and bluff communities um, as a group and learn more about how they have survived all this time um, since logging and quarrying and, and the furnace culture. Um, has passed on. So I'm gonna stop share and join everybody on the screen. Well, thanks a lot, Peggy. That's that's such a cool view of these places that are really, really special, right? So you go to, you know, Kelly's Run or Tuckwan or, or House Rock or Clark, um, Climbers, Helm, and they just feel, they have a feel to them. You don't even have to know what the things are that compose the community, the ecosystem, right? They just have this, for me anyway, they have this really primal feel to them. And you just put words to that, right? There's a reason why. And they're, they are ancient, in fact. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, like you said, has to do with land use. So I'm gonna go there next, I think, but I wanna start out with your research that you did on the elevator, because you know, I'm, a, I'm an insect nerd. And, and that's, that, that research that you've done is pretty fascinating. We got a really good question on this that actually I, I had the same thing. And so has it been confirmed conclusively with repeated sampling that the yellow bandit has in fact been extirpated from the southern end of its range, like from our area, we are for sure 100% certain that they're gone from here. Is that correct? No. Okay. We're not 100% sure. <laughs> so you will note, Keith, because we work together, that whenever I take my sneaky breaks up to the mountains, you know, I always say I'm going to go look for bumbleberries. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'm always looking. I'm always looking, especially in these types of you know elevated or perched communities. Um, especially during flowering season when the resources are out there for these for this species to collect. Like I said earlier, confirmed um, and healthy colonies still exist in Pennsylvania. Um, it seems to be those elevated bogs, you know, the Bear Meadows area, um, south of State College and the Roth Rock State Forest. And there are other sites in and around Bear Meadows. And again, I'm not going to give my coordinates. Um, I do share that with the Wild Bee Lab. Um, Keith, uh, Sam Drogi down in um, Beltsville and let him know if I, if I find my species and, and, and give him that information. However, going back to the original question, are they extirpated? 90%. Um, so 90% of their original range as it existed in 1900. So I'm comparing this to 1900. We no longer have the species found as commonly as it was. And by common, I can say with certainty you know, that my great grandmother um, in her farmer's journal has pictures of the yellow band and bubble bee in the orchard. Wow. Yeah. But that was before certain chemicals were used in orchard crops. So, and that was in your county. So yeah, so 90% of, of range loss in Pennsylvania, it seems everything's moving north latitude um, in terms of colonies and up in altitude. Yeah. And so just a reminder, everybody, if you have more questions for Peggy, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll, we'll get to you. But I've got a list here <laughs> that, that have popped up already. So you mentioned uh, ne neonics or neonics, right? So can you say a little bit more about them? I mean, they are really, to my, to my mind, some of the scariest insecticides that we've ever developed. Yeah, they are. I, I agree with you 110%. Um, so this type of uh, um, insecticide and this is the, the current thinking in terms of the yellow banded bumblebee. Um, yellow banded is related genetically to 
three other species of concern. So the rusty banded I mean, is a group that are all declining rapidly. So because of their genetic similarities and the fact they're all related to each other, um, we wonder if this particular insecticide isn't having you know, a family-wide effect, um, whereas some of our common and surviving species of bumblebee, like in patient, bumbus and patients, you know, um, common Eastern, are not as sensitive to this particular um, chemical. Well, they are sensitive, but it, it's not, you know, it's not a genetic family. What's even more concerning though, and, and so few people know this and appreciate this, um, you know the tomatoes you can buy in the store? Like we can get tomatoes year round now, right? We don't have to wait till summer to harvest our tomatoes. Um, but the tomato industry, as well as other um, crops that require bumblebee pollination, and tomatoes are specific to bumblebees, um, a lot of their um, industrial sized greenhouse operations use shipped in bumblebees um, of a certain species that come from areas in Europe. So they're transported here for use in our tomato um, industry, greenhouse industry. And with them came a fungal disease or maybe several fungal diseases that again, the families related to Bombus terracola just have suffered for. So those bumblebees don't stay contained in these greenhouses. They do escape, they do get into the wild. Um, and as a fungal infection, uh, moist air, rain, uh, even just, you know, air quality can help these fungal diseases spread through colonies like wildfire. So combine the pesticide with the fungal disease and the loss of habitat, you've got a perfect storm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that's scary uh, to me about the, the neon, neonics is uh, that it, it can get incorporated into the pollen. So yeah. you go to a box store and you buy a plant that at some point in time, it was treated with a, a neonic insecticide. Um, and it's, it's still not on that plant, but it's incorporated into the pollen. You take it home and then you're exposing all the pollinators to that chemical that's lethal. And so, um, you know, I've read a couple of interesting studies about the effects of these things long after purchase um, and how it gets incorporated into pollen and then either affects bee behavior, which is an indirect uh, lethal effect or directly, directly kills them. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the cases uh, or one of the uh, species that's declining that we would hope the conservancy would provide some refuge areas for them. And maybe we do. We just haven't surveyed for them. I mean, it's not like there's a bunch of people going out there looking for bees, right? Yep. One of the things that we did look for, though, is one of the questions we got is, are there other things on in the area that we would expect to find that we don't? And when we, we did our master plan for Helen Hills, we spent days looking for eastern timber rattler snakes, rattlesnakes, like the t rattlers. And when I was telling people this and I was getting really, really excited about the prospect and the possibility of finding a rattlesnake, are they you nuts? I'm like, no, not at all. They're no, beautiful no, animals no, no, no. and they're incredible. And every time I'm on one of those rocky slopes, I'm looking and I'm hoping. I mean, I'm not sticking my hand blindly into holes, but, um, you know, that's another organism that I worry about because their range is significantly shrinking. And I believe in Pennsylvania, they're just north of Harrisburg now, but they used to be here. And so I still hold hope that we could find some of them maybe at places like Helen Hills, like I mean, a lot of those areas that you've described, those kinds of habitats. Although yep. we spent so much time looking over those scree slopes at Helen, I'd be really, really surprised if we were still uh, lucky enough to find one. And that's true for all of the elevated communities, Rocky Bluff communities and cliffside communities with the, the Lancaster Conservancy preserves. You know, there's the chance that these types of animals that depend on that type of habitat do still exist, but there have to be people out there looking for them. Right, yeah, right. We need people Whatever. out looking. And so, you know, that's, yeah. a, that's a great point on the bumblebees, right? So, you know, there is, there is a really cool citizen science program that we're thinking about trying to launch here at the Conservancy, be, a bumble, bumblebee watch, basically. And it trains people up on how to do those identifications and, and looking for them. And we did get a question about the, the, the neonics. And that is, that is what the insecticide that is, is uh, having an effect on monarchs in addition to bees. So, you know, those insecticides are not selective. It'll, it'll wipe out any, any insect and anything that's going after pollen and nectar is going to be affected um, specifically. And it's um, so important to make sure that if you're buying seed for the upcoming season, whether it's for a large garden or whatever, you know, check to see that if they're pre-treated. Um, they'll sometimes be like a color. Um, they indicate pre-treatment with purple and blue. Yeah. So you can ask to, to look inside or read a package carefully. Um, but if you get home and, and you see that, oh, you didn't realize it was pre-treated, well, we probably wouldn't plant those seeds. It's basically a nerve agent. 
right? Yeah, right. It is. Um, yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it yeah, affects the nervous system. Long term persistent. You know, yep. Just like the, you know, it's a different class of chemical than the organochlorine pesticides, the DDTs and the DDEs that we outlawed, by the way, for a good reason. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. You know, there's there's work that we're doing as a conservancy to to uh, protect other species as well, and and one of the focus areas that we have are birds and bats. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we lost a lot of grassland nesting birds are on a steep steep decline, and so a lot of the work that we're doing at um, you know at Kelly's Run and especially at Wizard Ranch Helm Hills is restoring those grasslands, uh, safe harbor too, to try to get some of those um, those grassland nesting birds back in, like bob white quail um, and um, uh, meadowlark. And, you know, we got a question, is there any chance to reintroduce any of the species? And I personally think yes. Now, that, that's not part of any of our management plans right now as a conservancy. We're really focused on getting the habitat in the right place and waiting to see who's going to come back in once we get that, mm -hmm. that habitat correct. But Peggy and I are working on restoring Climbers Run. We've been kicking that idea around for a year that Peggy's been with us now. And, you know, restoring that back, that back meadow that's, uh, you know, two or three acres into some really good native grassland. And then converting the forest that right now is infested with invasive species back into an oak savanna that indeed would support a bobwhite quail population. And I've talked to one of our great volunteer land stewards, Sarah Gottwals, who's a bird expert, and she's actually done reintroductions of bobwhites. And so that is certainly something that's a possibility for us that again, is not part of our management plan, but it's things that we are, we're talking about. And your best hope would be when you're doing restoration ecology like that, the, the, the ideal would be that, you know, a range reintroduction would happen on its own. So an animal or a population of animals that is at first absent from that habitat. Once the habitat is restored, that they'll come back on their own. That happens a lot with insects um, and birds. So it kind of does follow the rule for some species. If you build it, they will come. Um, but here's, here's a, I'm throwing this out to all our volunteers and our potential volunteers. It takes people to manage these restoration sites and it takes people to watch them and to monitor them, to know what has come back, what hasn't come back. What did we expect? What showed up that we didn't expect, you know, um, good or bad. So yeah, it takes people to really focus in and, and manage these restored areas with a sharp eye and to monitor in terms of, you know, I, I every day I thank all of those people who are now long gone, who provided those samples of Bombus terracola for those collections. I, there were 15 different natural history museums, including the Smithsonian that I worked with um, for the po people who left notes and, and left coordinates and, and all the information they could find about the habitat where they were working um, with each of their samples. So that's important, not just for us now with the Conservancy, but in our, in our mission, right? We're, we're preserving this land forever. Let's preserve that information forever too. So 100 yeah. years from now, you know, our, our you know, I don't know, descendants in terms of conservation um, management will be able to look at this information and, and see how far we've come um, and what we need to do from there. Yeah, and you know, and we are we're really in the infancy of, of uh, pretty significantly developing our volunteer program. And I certainly have, and I think we share that vision of, you know, really engaging a lot of our volunteers in that citizen science work of monitoring the organisms that are present pre, during and post restoration. And in this region, I don't think we're ever done restoration, right? I think it takes constant no. vigilance. You know, we're doing significant invasive species removals on a, on a huge, large scale at, at Wizard in York, uh, Climbers, Kelly's, Clark, and, and we're never going to be done that. We'll get ahead of it. We certainly are getting ahead of it in these places. And it's very rewarding to see the native stuff come back in the next season even. Mm -hmm. But it takes constant vigilance to go back out and retreat and retreat and retreat. And you know, and, and a good a good example of how this worked really really well is Welsh Mountain is one of our most pristine preserves, right? It's it's probably one of our oldest forests. About I mean, it's related to the geology, right? We've got a quartzite that's the same geology that's at the Helen Hills Preserve, that same spine of quartzite that goes through, which forms really really shallow, really really nutrient poor soils. And so we've got these oak trees; they're only about that big around, but they're probably 100 150 years old. Easily, right? so they're easily. stunted, and that forest is largely free of invasives. So how cool! But every time we get a gap in the canopy, sunlight hits that forest floor, that's the limiting factor. And then all of a sudden the invasives can go nuts. We had a couple of volunteer land stores that adopted uh, Welsh and they were hiking it and found one of those gaps covered in tear thumb, a non-native uh, invasive species. They called me up and said, hey, we, got tear we have a tear thumb eruption. The next week we had a crew of volunteers out there eliminating the tear thumb, right? So it was kind of like putting out a little wildfire. But it really, yeah. really worked based on volunteers going out and reporting back to us what they found and then us responding to that. So 
there's a lot of there's there's a lot of hope that we can we can stay ahead of this stuff through volunteer assistance. Oh, that's a great point. And and Mike, we are going to have more of these uh, training sessions uh, to help volunteers know what to look for and how to record that, right? And so we've got a uh, an invasive identification class coming up. We actually have a, a program here on Saturday at Climbers Run um, on uh, invasive identification removals, and we'll be doing more and more of that at a couple of different locations, um, definitely. And related to that, and I think we'll close it out with this, we had a great question about um, what can people do in their own lives to protect the organisms that we're protecting on our preserves? And so if you want to take, you want me to take a first swipe at that or do you want to take a first swipe at that? Oh gosh, no, you know how we finish each other's sentences? Yes. Let's just do that. <laughs> start, I'll cut you off. All right. And so, you know, really it, it comes down to, you know, if get involved as a volunteer land steward is one way. Um, but there's simpler ways than that too, right? The, the invasives that we are fighting on our preserves came from people's backyards and they still do. So burning bush, for example, produces these beautiful red berries that birds eat. And then they fly maybe 10 miles to the preserve and poop out those berries in a nice wad of fertilizer. And now we have an eruption of burning bush in our forest, right? So eliminating the, uh, the invasives and non-native species from your own landscaping, I think is a great way. Um, talking and to I, your, I think oh, educating, yeah. educating, educating yourself on not just what's native, non-native, um, but the things that even, even with native plants, you find it a nursery, you know, when I go to a nursery, whether it's a big box store or whether it's, um, for me, it's Heartwood, uh, Sue's wonderful, wonderful Holly nursery here in York County. That, and she also does a, a huge menu of um, native plants. I watch to see what those, if they're flowering, where the bumblebees are going, where the insects are going, where the monarchs are going. You know, they're there and they're feeding on the stock. If, if, a, if, a, if an insect isn't feeding on a certain display or a certain patch of landscaping plants that are flowering that say at Home Depot, I'm not knocking Home Depot, but just watch to see, you know, what's visiting those flowers that they have and shrubs that they have out um, and ask, ask if they're even aware um, before you buy that there's this problem with not just introduced species in terms of things we can see, but I mentioned with the bumblebees, the you know, fungal diseases and um, those pre-treated seeds. So, and, you know, educate yourself about the purchasing end of things, too, as you're thinking about your own yard or, um, you know, working on a school courtyard or, or a community garden. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, in terms of educating yourself, we have a number of, of uh, other uh, outreach interpret programs coming up. And, you know, we're going to finish out this uh, virtual series, but then we transition into a really, a really healthy series of in-person outdoor interpretive events. And so if you go to the LancasterConservancy.org webpage and then check out uh, upcoming events, that's where all of those opportunities, those learning opportunities are listed. Um, you know, we got one coming up here in person on, what is it, the 15th of February, right, with Raven Ridge. It's going to yep. be baby, baby animal season soon. And then, you know, yeah. we go and we find all these baby birds and baby bunnies and the wildly free habbers get flooded with these poor baby animals that didn't need to be rescued, <laughs> right? So yeah. it's going to be a great presentation from our partners at Raven Ridge about you know, when should we intervene and when shouldn't we? And if we should, how should we? Um, as one example, right? We've got a number of, of uh, native plant classes that are ongoing uh, through the rest of this year into the summertime through the fall. We've got a number of hikes that are being led by Peggy. Some of them are gonna be led by me. Um, so, you know, come on out to those. We, the more the merrier, check out the event page uh, to, to learn more about that. And speaking of that, our next um, nature hour, which I'm really excited about, right? Is gonna be February 8th, uh, talking about the Pennsylvania outdoor recreation economy. We protect land for a whole bunch of different reasons. And economics is usually not at the top of people's lists for reasons why we wanna set land aside. But that is a real, um, a real benefit of land protection is it, it is an economic driver locally. And so we have local uh, outdoor recreation economies that are forming in the Susquehanna Riverlands conservation landscape in our region. Um, and it's just really excited to hear about this. And Silas uh, Chamberlain, who is on our board is an expert on this. He did his PhD research on trails and the effect of trails on, on, on town economics. And um, he is the chief strategy officer of the York Economic Alliance. He's gonna join us on February 8th for our next Nature Hour to talk about the specifics of that outdoor recreation economy in the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm just uh, really encouraged to see that because I'm usually coming at things from a biodiversity protection perspective. That's, that's my legacy to my next seven generations, right? The work that I'm doing here now is what I'm leaving behind for the next seven generations. Um, 
I'm not thinking about the economic benefits, but that's certainly an important piece of this. And so thanks for joining us, everybody. Peggy, thank you so much. We got so much more to talk about now. Holy cow. Oh <laughs> Are we going to get any work done anymore? We're just going to sit no. and talk. We don't get much work done, do we? Yeah, right. Not at all. No, we don't do anything. And, <laughs> and thank you all. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.